Hi everyone and welcome to our presentation today. Uh, today we'll talk through Docker Data Center. Uh, we had an awesome release earlier this week, so we'll talk through some of the new updates that um, came as a result of that with our um, integration with the Engine 112. And today I'm joined with uh, Vivek Sereswa. So Vivek, thanks for being here. No problem, thanks for having me. As well as Harish Jai Kumar. So Harish, thanks for hopping on as well. Um, before thanks, we... Awesome. So before we kick things off, I just want to remind everyone that this presentation is being recorded. So what we'll do is we'll follow up with you later on in the week and provide the recording to you via email. So look out for that. Um, and at that point, you'll be able to share it with anyone that you'd like, or you can give it another watch as well. Um, also, towards the end of this presentation, we'll save about 10 or 15 minutes for some Q&A. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask, um, you have the opportunity to do so. So you can post questions at any time um, using the Q&A chat. Um, portal here within WebEx, and we'll try to address as many as we can later on. Um, so before we actually delve into Docker Data Center, I think it's important to really understand some of the context be between it, right? So um, we realize that enterprise teams are kind of in the midst of this thing that's being called uh, digital transformation, right? And Docker is really at the center of that, and there's really three core aspects of it. You have this concept of app modernization, which could be moving from monolithic application architectures to a microservices one. It could also be uh, containerizing these legacy applications and then shifting around to different environments for, from a portability um, standpoint as well. Um, we found that out three out of four organizations are actually looking to modernize their applications today. Um, the second piece is DevOps. Um, so some of y'all might be in the midst of going DevOps, so this you know, embracing this cultural shift within um, your houses today, right? Um, and really this is the concept of breaking down those traditional barriers that have existed between developer teams and IT operations teams as well, right? So 44% of enterprise teams today are actually looking to adopt DevOps within their enterprise. And then lastly, there's cloud. Um, there's probably not much um, I need to say about this one. I'm sure you're all very familiar, but 80% of you um, Docker as central to their cloud strategy, which could include you know, hybrid cloud strategies as well as multi-cloud uh, strategies as well. And um, if you look at that quick kind of chart on the left-hand side, you see that companies who are running you know, te container technology from Docker today, now it's around with 50 or 500 plus employees, 73% are running them in production, which I think is pretty interesting, right? It's not just a developer tool, it's a production-ready solution as well. Um, so this idea of containerization and the growth of containerization is what led to us creating this enterprise platform, Docker Data Center, which we'll showcase today. We'll talk through the updates and then show a demo, right? Um, and really what this is, it's a supported enterprise container management platform, and it's built for two key groups, being developers and IT operations teams, the goal being to deliver agility, portability, and control. Um, so I'll showcase a little bit of what that platform um, looks like, but first it's important to understand these key pieces and core values that Docker Data Center provides being uh, agility, portability, and control. So if you look at agility from a developer standpoint, it's really giving them the ability to self-service select from this pool of secured images that have been deemed okay for use by the IT ops team. And what that enables them to do is build applications quickly and update applications quickly when necessary. And on the IT app side, they have the agility to keep up with uh, changing business needs. So from a portability standpoint, and you know, this is perhaps one of the, the biggest use cases for Docker to begin with, the portability that Docker containers provide. Um, but from a developer standpoint, it's that seamless and, and streamlining the pipeline in terms of moving from dev, test, staging, and into production, given the fact that the application runs the same exact way regardless of environment without having to tweak the code. Um, from an IT ops standpoint, you have the ability to migrate workloads to any environment that you'd like, right? So it's completely agnostic. So if you have a multi-cloud strategy where you're leveraging Azure and AWS, or you have a hybrid cloud strategy where you have bare metal servers and, let's say, AWS or Azure, you have the ability to migrate those workloads wherever you'd like and run them where it makes sense from a business standpoint. And then lastly, there's the control aspect of it. So from a dev standpoint, you, uh, the developers can actually go out and define what an application needs to run, and IT ops have the ability to actually um, manage and secure the overall environment and reduce costs while doing that. Um, so here's a quick look at what the Docker Data Center platform looks like. As you can see, um, it's fully integrated, so it includes 
the engine, which is actually the container runtime, and um, some of the new built-in orchestration features, uh, which Vivek and Harish will showcase in, in just a few minutes, um, as well as the registry component, which is where you actually store and secure your, your image, uh, your images as well. Um, we have some cool features like um, Docker Content Trust, which is image signing, which we'll touch on a little later. I know um, prior to the webinar, a few of you have had expressed some interest in the signing component of it, so we'll make sure we'll talk through that as well. And then lastly is the management layer, which is called Universal Control Plane. And this is really uh, how you manage, deploy, scale, and provision infrastructure um, as well. And we'll talk about some of the improvements we've made to the GUI there from a, a user standpoint. Um, and we realize that, of course, security is important. Right, so it's not just securing the content, but it's securing the access to the content and the cluster as well. Um, and the, of course, the benefit of Docker is that it can run in any environment, right? Whether you're running it in a physical, virtual, or cloud, um, and the plugins that go along with it. All right, so a quick snapshot. Um, this next slide kind of walks you through the workflow. I won't spend a ton of time here because I want to be able to get to what's new and the demo as well. But um, we talk about build, ship, run, right? Our goal here at Docker is to enable teams to build, ship, and run applications in any environment. And this is how you would do that from a workflow standpoint using Docker Data Center, right? You build applications, um, create images, you store those images in a secured registry, which is actually deployed on premises. And then when you're actually ready to go and run that application, you can use Universal Control Plane to pull that image and then run it in production at scale. And again, you have the portability to move it from um, your cloud environment as well as um, your on-premises and kind of migrate those workloads um, accordingly. So with that being said, I'll pass it off to Vivek, who will talk about some of the new features that we've just built into the latest version of Docker Data Center. Hey everybody, thanks Chris. Uh, my name is Vivek Sarswas. I am a product manager on the Docker Data Center team. So let's talk about what's new in the newest, latest version of Docker Data Center. This was released uh, the beginning of this week on Monday, and it consists of a couple of different pieces. Universal Control Plane uh, 2.0, Docker Trusted Registry 2.1, and the new uh, commercially supported Docker Engine 1.12.3. <clears throat> so there's a lot of new things in this release. Uh, we've, we've uh, rebuilt a lot of the architecture natively on top of the new Docker 112 built-in swarm mode orchestration. So I'm not going to walk through everything on this slide because we have a couple of deep dives ahead. But in general, the three areas that we we're really trying to cover with this release were uh, improved orchestration and application deployment and management. Uh, so things there like uh, the ability to use the Docker service command while maintaining backwards compatibility with Docker Run and Docker Compose. End-to-end uh, -end security, so in, uh, new areas around uh, image signing and enforcement, as well as improved access control through RBAC labels. Uh, and finally, just in general, a better user experience, easier install, refreshed GUI that's more intuitive and easier to use, things like health checks and tag metadata and activity streams to make it easier to follow your application deployment processes. So we'll walk through each of these, but uh, quite, quite a large set of improvements in this, uh, uh, in this release. If you have any questions on particular areas, just bring them up at the end, and I'm happy to talk through any individual piece. So a quick look at the Docker Data Center architecture. If you're familiar with the old architecture, it's fairly similar uh, from a high-level perspective. Uh, as an admin, you deploy a series of UCP managers that are highly available. So you can either have one if you don't want an HA setting. You could have three, five, or seven, depending on how many failures you're willing to tolerate. Uh, and between those managers, they contain the internal distributed store of the cluster. So the managers store the state of the cluster. Uh, it used to be stored in an external key value store. Now that state is stored within the, the built-in swarm mode orchestration within the Docker engines. Those UCP managers then manage a series of UCP workers, which provide the uh, application workload management. Uh, separately, you have Docker Trusted Registry. So Docker Trusted Registry replicas, these are highly available, provide image registry and storage management. And these are sitting within UCP nodes, so they're part of the UCP cluster, uh, but they can be kept separate from UCP applications. And you can bring your own TCP-based load balancer on top of the DTR replicas in order to load balance requests against DTR. And you can do that against UCP as well uh, with a different load balancer. So that's the architecture within Docker Data Center. You can plug in external, uh, external plugins such as uh, certificate authorities, your LDAP Active Directory system for authentication, logging and monitoring solutions, and various storage backends, including NFS, S3 compatible, and local file system. 
So let's talk a little bit first about some of the built-in orchestration and networking uh, features that we've we provided as part of the new platform. <clears throat> the building block of the newest version of Docker Data Center is Docker Engine 112. Uh, so the, the biggest advantage with Docker Engine 112 is it provides a built-in orchestration with scheduling, network, and, and with scheduling and networking. Uh, it's a very powerfully, it's simple built-in orchestration platform. You can actually start it uh, on top of the Docker engine with uh, a Docker swarm init command, and it creates a cluster for you. And if you choose, you can then install UCP directly on top of it, which is an advantage from the old version. Or UCP will start and create a cluster directly for you. Uh, some of the advantages that the Docker engine provides are declarative app services and built-in container-centric networking and built-in default security. We will talk about each of these three in depth in the next couple of slides. And as we mentioned in the previous slides, it's also extensible with various plugins, drivers, and uh, the entire open Docker API. <clears throat> a quick deep dive into the UCP manager nodes uh, and what's changed and, and what they provide on top of the open source. So in addition to the swarm mode, which provides built-in orchestration, the UCP manager nodes also simultaneously run a Swarm 1.x, the container-based Swarm uh, architecture with Swarm manager and Swarm join containers. That means that we provide simultaneous support for both Swarm mode and for the old backwards compatible Swarm 1.x service. That means you can run, and I'll talk more about this in detail, both your new serv Docker service commands, if you've seen 1.12, as well as your existing traditional Docker run applications. We also provide a point-and-click UI to manage the various resources within your cluster, nodes, services, containers, and networks. We provide both CLI and API support through the Docker API. Uh, and we provide secure access control through uh, auth-end, through LDAP and Active Directory support, so you can choose who has access to the cluster, as well as granular role-based access control to determine what level of access each person in each team has to the cluster. Finally, we add content security policy enforcement through image signing, and again, I'll talk more about that in the end-to-end -end security service. The high-level point here is we, we sit on top of the open source Docker and provide a series of additional benefits, primarily around backwards compatibility, as well as uh, enhancements from a security and an enterprise-grade perspective. <clears throat> One of, the, one of the big things about the new Docker 112 is that it is fully secure clusters by default. So what that means is that you have out-of-box TLS, so in all communications between the managers and workers are fully encrypted uh, with its own built-in certificate authority. And with a new UCP, it's very easy to provide external CA integration as well. Uh, instead of having to do it at install time, you can actually just go into the GUI and insert your new certificates. Uh, but the big thing here is that this is, this is one-way communication so that any commands go directly to the managers and those managers give it to the workers, but the workers can't give commands to the managers. So your cluster is fully secured, one-way communication, and you can be ensured that uh, incoming communication can't be intercepted. One of the other big features coming out of the new uh, Swarm 112 is container-centric networking. We've heard from you that load balancing and service discovery are pieces that customers really want and users really want directly built within the Docker Data Center platform. Uh, in the previous version of Docker Data Center, you had to use a reference architecture based on Interlock, uh, a third-party open source project, in order to provide load balancing and service discovery. Now, for the new services command, you can do that directly from within UCP. So the way this works is uh, there's something called a routing mesh, which is a service that provides multi-host container-centric logical networks. This means that when you create a new, uh, a new series of Docker containers, you can ensure that uh, any, any traffic that's routed across uh, to those containers is routed to all containers within a service. So for example, and I'll talk more about how services work, but if you expose a particular port like 8080, for a uh, for a, set, a specific application, no matter which node in your UCP cluster you hit, on uh, if you hit port 8080, that command or that set of that packet will automatically be routed to the correct application that you're looking for. So again, uh, with our built-in load balancing and DNS resolution, we intelligently route external traffic to the right container, regardless of what host you're looking to do. And if you want to learn more about how this works, uh, a little bit later in the week, I think tomorrow, we'll be releasing a blog post around networking and load balancing, as well as a reference architecture to talk about this some more. We'll make sure we include that link to that blog and the follow-up as well. Uh, so the, the routing mesh that we described in the previous slide is great if you want to do port-based routing mesh. 
uh, one of the, what it, well, so what happens if you'd like to do host name based routing, intelligent layer seven application based routing? Well, an experimental feature currently available in the new Docker data center is the HTTP routing mesh. This allows you to take that port based routing mesh and extend it to host name based routing for services. That means that to the use of labels, you can actually route, say, a domain name like foo.com to an external load balancer on a single port and make sure that foo.com always goes to the application foo that you want it to go to, and that bar.com will always route to another application, say, the bar application that you want it to. Uh, and th this means, again, that you can provide a little bit more intelligent uh, routing based on the HTTP header. Uh, so as I mentioned before, this, uh, this is an experimental feature and it's available, uh, but we're continuing to work on it. Uh, I recommend taking a look at that reference architecture and that blog post on networking that we'll send out before the end of the week. The next big feature that we're looking at, the uh, next big set of features in Docker Data Center on Engine 112 is the ability to more easily deploy and manage applications. Uh, making first-class applications is really important to us within Docker. We want to make it so you have all the tools you need to deploy and manage your application in an automated fashion. The first thing that we did around this in the new version is what we call application desired state using the Docker service command. So in, you know, in, the, in the original version of Swarm, uh, you, if you wanted to say have three instances of your Redis key value store, you'd have to do Docker run three times in order to create three instances of that application. Then if you needed to, if one of those instances went down, you had to manually create a new Docker, uh, Docker run, a new container in order to manage it. So you had to, you had to manage all of these aspects yourself. With a new Docker service command, we have an API that allows you to define the state of the world that you want. So in this case, you say, I want, Red I want a service based on Redis, and I want three containers or three instances of that service Redis in my cluster at all times. So you will use a Docker service, replicas equals three, command, and then the uh, swarm mode and UCP will ensure that you always have three instances of that Redis container running in your cluster at all time. And they're all load balanced and resolved against the service name, let's say Redis, that you created. So you, there's no need for you to run Docker run each time. Instead, you just update the service uh, with whatever changes you want to make, whatever diffs you have, and Swarm will ensure that those changes are then defined. And you can define things like uh, the, the type of image that you want to use, the networks that you want connected, any ports you want exposed for routing mesh purposes, health checks, et cetera. So again, just from an architecture standpoint, you create a service. Each, that service consists of several different containers of the same image name. And uh, each of those containers is defined by a single task. So in this case, we have the service Redis. We have three tasks, each representing a single Redis container. And they're all managed under one name. How it works is pretty simple. So you'll do a Docker service create command. So you declare the, uh, the, the, the attributes that you want out of your, uh, in your service. The swarm mode will then break down that service into each of those individual container tasks, schedule them across the various workers in your cluster, and execute. Periodically, if you decide that you want to make changes to your environment, or if something happens like one of those containers goes down, the engines uh, on the workers will check to see and compare against what you've declared, and will then ensure that that state is reconciled. So if one of those three containers goes down, it'll automatically spin up a new one for you. If you decide you want four containers now, then it'll automatically spin up a new one for you as part of the reconciliation process. You know, in addition to all this, in ensuring that the, you know, the, the Docker service command provides a whole new set of functionality, as an enterprise benefit, we want to make sure that all of your existing applications function the way that you want to. And we recognize that you can't necessarily transition directly to this new, this new uh, framework immediately. So as we mentioned before, UCP2 makes it e automatically deploys and manages the sort of classic Swarm 1.x cluster along with Swarm mode. You don't have to manage this at all. It's all taken care of for you. But what it means is that you can use Docker Run and Docker Compose Up in your CLI just like you used to, and your commands will continue to still work. Uh, it also means you can view single containers and tasks and composed apps and even generate composed apps based on Docker Run containers directly from the UI, just as you used to be able to. And you can exec and view logs of container tasks directly uh, from the UI. So UCP allows you to, do, to maintain a backwards compatibility that you'd have to either uh, wouldn't be able to do or, or stitch together yourself from the open source. That's one of our enterprise benefits. 
The next area that's important to us uh, within the new set of features in Docker Data Center is end-to-end -end security. So the current version of UCP provides several features around security, particularly role-based access control, but we've really expanded that pipeline so that you have security all the way from when your developers are building their applications all the way to when you're actually running this in production. Our goal with Docker Data Center is really to give you the, the tools you need to provide a, a secure software supply chain. So what are some of the enhancements that we've provided as a result of this? The first thing is uh, we've enhanced our role-based access control system in a number of ways. Uh, in the previous version of UCP, you had the ability to provide labels, access labels for containers that allowed you to determine which, uh, <clears throat> to set restrictions around which users could access which uh, container-based applications. We've extended that label-based RBAC for both services, the new Docker service command, as well as for networks. So it works very similarly to the way that uh, it, it used to work in USB 1, but now we've extended that same functionality to these new, uh, to, to these two sets of resources. We've also uh, worked to protect system resources, and we define that as UCP and DTR-based containers from non-admins. This is an ask from several customers. Uh, we, we listen to you and we've moved forward on this. All UCP DTR containers, networks, and volumes are by default now hidden from non-admins. That means that somebody can't accidentally delete one of your volumes in UCP and cause the entire deployment to potentially, uh, to potentially suffer as a result. So on access control, we've enhanced both the RBAC with labels for services and networks, and we're protecting your system resources from non-admins as well. The next feature I want to talk about, and this is a big one, is how we're using image signing. So some of you may have heard of Notary or Docker Content Trust, which is our ability for, to provide uh, cryptographic image signing to allow you to determine uh, the identity of someone who published an image uh, using the Notary technology. And this is based on the open source update framework that allows you to provide, uh, to provide this cryptographic image signing. So within UCP, we've added the ability to actually enforce the use of signatures on the cluster. Uh, this means that in UCP, you can, there's a setting within the admin setting that you can say, I want to run only signed images on the cluster, and I want to say, I require signatures from these multiple groups of teams. So I require a signature from the dev team. I require a signature from the security team. I require a signature from the ops team. You can define how many sets of signatures from teams that you want or you can allow any UCP user to sign. This means that you can set uh, controls on what kind of applications are allowed in your cluster. You can set up gates that allow you to determine which users can, uh, which users can uh, set up an application and when an application is ready to run in the cluster. Importantly, in the new version of DTR, DTR actually sets up a notary server for you. So you don't have to install the notary server yourself. Once you set up UCP and DTR, you have a notary server. You just have to initialize uh, various repositories within Notary uh, based on which, uh, which images that you actually want to be signed. Uh, and then when you take those images over to UCP, you ensure that the images are signed with the correct number of signatures that are required based on the policy you set in UCP. Well, what does this really allow you to do? It allows you to set a series of checkpoints for the purpose of, 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 and thresholds for the purpose of signing and gating your application. So an example, let's say you have a CI CD system with an image uh, and you want to make sure that you've, you've built a new image and then you set a checkpoint to say, okay, before this goes into a staging or production environment, uh, I want to approve that image through whatever security protocols I have. So you might have your devs first sign it to ensure that they've created the image, goes to CI CD, then you have your security team run through and say, hey, uh, I want to run my own protocol so I get to sign it too. Okay, so then it signs it. Now, when you're actually running to the uh, UCP worker, uh, you, first you go through, say, staging, and you've ensured that the application works, so then you sign it in prod. In order to get into prod, you need to have all of those signatures set up, the dev signature, the security signature, and maybe the, the ops release signature. Uh, so thus, with this new enforcement policy on a cluster-by-cluster -cluster basis, you can ensure that the right levels of security and gates are being provided across your environment. Okay, so that's just a very, very quick overview of some of the new features, and I'm happy to take more questions to elaborate at the end. But you're probably tired of hearing me talk at this point, so I'm gonna turn this over to Harish Jayakumar, one of our uh, solutions engineers, who's gonna give you an actual demo of how this all works in process. Harish, over to you. All right, thanks a lot. 
I'm going to start sharing my Uh, Chris, can you confirm it? Yep, sure. It's coming up right now. All right, I see it. We're at the um, at the login page. All right, cool. Uh, I'm the solutions engineer here at uh, Docker. So I'm going to be kind of showing you guys. Hey, Arie, I think your audio is a little. I think your audio might be a little jumpy. Just so you know. Everyone can you hear me? With yes, I think we can hear you a lot more clearly now. It's perfect. Okay, so video thing. Uh, the solutions engineer we're going to be seeing today is the E2.0 and DTR 2.1 version of Docker data set. What you're seeing is the. Hey, Arish, maybe you should switch to either the phone or computer, whichever one's opposite. Unfortunately, this one's a bit jumpy. All right, I'm going to move a little bit here. Hold on a second. Sure, no worries. It's perfectly. Hopefully Everyone this is generally... Generally... Yes, for now it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, not sure what's going on. Uh, or maybe real quick, if I want, I can just call into my phone the next time this happens. Um, so let's log in. I'm out logging in as an admin. Cool. So as soon as you log in, this is the admin screen that you guys see. As you can see, um, we've completely revamped the whole GUI uh, uh, to go for a more minimalistic approach and to give you all the data that you want to see and easily accessible across it. Right as soon as you log in, you you can see that I have three nodes, um, services that are running 23 containers, nine of them have stopped, a full view of your entire cluster that's happening. Uh, you can actually just look into this right out of back and see what's going on over here. And here's the quick bars that we've added, which basically we've, we kind of did the research on what's the common things that people do. And that's why we kind of made sure that those common things you want to be able to do, you can actually easily access them from here instead of going through any of those main screens over, over there as well. So now let's jump into each of them. Obviously, this is a dashboard. Once you jump into resources, you can see that you have all the things that you want to be able to do from here. Um, first is this is the service thing that Vivek was talking about. You can actually just quickly go through and create a service from here itself if you want. Uh, and then, I don't know, maybe I want to use Redis. Uh, and then now here you have options, which is basically replicated or global. Basically replicated means, you know, I want to be able to um, have, have, say, three instances of Redis. Uh, the other option that a lot of people have kind of asked for and that's there in this release is the global one. Say, suppose you want to have uh, a service that you need to run on all of your nodes, I don't know, something for logging or any of those things. That one, you can just select it to be a uh, global and then once you set up, that container is going to be across then on, on, on all the nodes that are there, in my case, three. Um, and if you want to pass any um, commands or arguments across it, you can actually specify that as well. Um, scheduling, now we talked about the role base. Um, I mean, Vivek mentioned about updating in parallel. So you can actually spe specify options over here. These are for existing services. Say, suppose you already have existing services that are running. Now you want to update them, but you don't want to update them at all at the same time time. So now you have an option to actually set it up in parallel to say, okay, I want to be updating one container at a time or two containers at a time. Wait for two seconds before updating the next one. You know, things like that. Um, anyway, I'm going to skip this for now. You don't need this. Um, next is resources. So now you can talk about everything over here. You can actually specify what ports you want to be able to publish, what volumes you want to mount, how much CPU you want to be able to use, etc. And then you can set any labels that you want to be able to do as well on this. So you can completely go through the entire process and just apply a simple service from here too. Um, so what do we have? This one, you can just skip this. All right, let's deploy this. Um, so now it's going on, it's actually creating a simple Docker service over here. There you see it just quickly came back and said it's successfully created. 
it's red right now because it's it's kind of going back and spinning up three instances one at a time and then it'll turn, it'll turn green so that's how simple it is to go do that as well now okay so what i'm going to do is i just got a notification that uh, my audio is still a little broken so i'm going to quickly switch to my phone uh, bear with me for like two seconds and i should be able to do that sure no worries and thanks everyone on the on the call on the webinar for uh, the patients as well Uh, maybe if you want to take a couple of questions that have already come through, just to save time. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Let's take a quick look at those. Okay. okay. Yeah, sure. So we've got a question about Windows containers being supported in Docker Data Center. Uh, they are not supported in the current version of Docker Data Center we just released. However, definitely on the roadmap. Uh, definitely something that we are working on. Uh, there are some. You know, a certain set of, uh, uh, of uh, architectural challenges that we're working on to make that happen. So uh, we'll, we'll keep you we'll keep you posted as we continue along that path. Uh, a couple other questions: Is UCP what does that stand for? It stands for Universal Control Plane, uh, which is a part of the Docker Data Center solution. The three acronyms you're going to hear a lot: DDC for Docker Data Center, UCP for Universal Control Plane, which is a part of Docker Data Center and DTR for Docker Trusted Registry, which is a part of, also part of Docker Data Center. A uh, couple more questions. When will Docker Compose work with Swarm to deploy Swarm as a GA instead of experimental mode? Uh, so if the question is, when will Docker Compose deploy to multi-host? In UCP, Docker Compose does deploy to multi-host. So if you, but it deploys using Docker run containers. So uh, if you run the open source swarm mode, Docker Compose will only deploy to one node. If you run UCP, it will deploy to multiple nodes. And the reason for this is that we manage a classic swarm 1.x cluster side by side with a swarm mode cluster. Uh, that said, Docker Compose does not yet support services. That is something that is also on the roadmap. And I think we have Harish back now. Uh, this is much better, guys. Yeah, keep going. I'll let you know. I think it is, though. <laughs> okay, cool. No worries. Um, so that being said, um, so there you see those three containers came up. Um, that's, that's the service that came up uh, right now. The next thing we've also actually simplified is like, um, like what Vivek had talked about. Adding a node is like very, very simple right now. Basically, we're using the inbuilt swarm that's already in the engine, and it's as simple as just this, right? You can go here. It tells you what add node is, and that whole uh, token and built-in CA path that Vivek had covered during the slide, this is it. You can simply just select this if you want the node to be a manager. If not, you can just add this as another node. You just copy this to the clipboard. You can go to an instance. Actually, let's see. I think I do have an instance over here. Let's just try to add a node and show you guys. Uh... So this is nothing but uh, this is nothing but a node. A node is nothing but a VM that's running Docker engine right now. So I've just SSH'd to that node. Obviously, you can script all these things, right? I mean, you guys get that. I'm just trying to show you what it is to simply add a node. Um, and then we just want to be able to copy this. Let's go back here. Add a node, because I think they copied the other one, so that went up. Copy the clipboard. Go back here. And that's it. You see how instantaneous that was? Now the node just joined this one, and it's already a worker right now. Now we go back here, and we've added a worker real quick. So the biggest thing you can, you, you guys can kind of see, if, if, you're, if you're new, you, you, you'll see this, but if you're, if you're used to 1.x, you will see how fast and easy it is for you to kick off a service, be able to do, um, you know, just add a simple node to the cluster and get it up and running. So just as soon as we hit that, that's it. Now you pretty much have a cluster that the exchange has happened, the CAs have been, the, uh, the certificates have been exchanged, they've registered themselves as a worker with the UCP master, the master goes and deposits all these things, now you can start scheduling containers across all these things. So. They made it very, very simple and easy for you to be able to do all these things across it. So very powerful things from those sites. Um, the networks over here, obviously, so you can go create whatever network you want. 
Um, there you go. You can go set up any, any kind of an overlay network you have or bridge, whichever you choose. Or if you're using a third party, you can use that as well and you can set it up. So now you can actually go specify your network over here. Uh, you can set up any IPAM. If you're using something like Info, InfoBlox or any of those IPAM solutions, you can set that up and you can create networks from here as well. By the way, this is the UCP GUI that I'm showing you, and that's, that's mainly because that's the, you know, the orchestration kind of solution. But all these things um, are, you know, they, this is a Docker native solution. It talks 100% Docker native APIs. And that's a very, very, very important thing and a key differentiator between Docker data center and some of the other solutions in the market is I can take any Docker solution, any, uh, you know, Docker client, Docker Compose, any of those components that are existing there, make zero changes to it, and actually it will work right out of the box. A simple example being, which the snapshot that the head showed over here, most of you guys are familiar with the Compose side, right? That's all you need to do. You can completely drop the Compose file over here, as is, just copy paste it and create it, and, and you know, you go create an application. Or if you want to do the CLI, you can always go back here, and you can go do the Docker Compose up over here, and it is gonna go deploy the application from there as well. So this is very, very important because today it's Compose. Tomorrow it could be DAG. Uh, there could be another tool. Now Microsoft's coming up, there could be other clients, and all those will work out of the box without having to make any changes out of it. That's something, you know, it's very, very important for you to remember on that. I'm, I'm gonna deploy a Compose file, but I just wanted to show you, you know, mention how uh, the importance of that one over there. Uh, same concept with volumes. You can go create a volume over here. Uh, you can use third-party uh, storage drivers if you want, specify that, add it, and you can specify labels on that as well. So let's, let's take a step back over here and, and talk about one of the concepts called labels that's included with uh, UCP as well. Very powerful, again, from an enterprise perspective, is you can start labeling nodes, uh, not nodes currently. You can start uh, uh, labeling networks, volumes, and then you can assign those based on the role-based authentication for a specific user or team. So now you can actually say that, okay, these users are gonna be able to create these applications with this network and this group can be able to access it. All these become very, very important when you're actually deploying this interaction and you run it in scale, right? So some of the key things to keep in mind. Obviously, I'm logged in as an administrator, so these are the things I can see. Uh, if you see I have just created four new uh, users, Chris, as a full control user, um, he's just at uh, privileges just below the administrator. And then I've created a user called Harish who has only view only. So if I log out now and log in as Harish, it only see the containers and applications that he, Harish, has deployed. Um, Jack will have no access at all to the system. Vivek will have some restricted access to the system depending upon this. Again, these are very, very important on it. Uh, when you're actually looking at, you know, adding those role-based authentication controls. Now let's look at some of the administrator settings. I'm, I'm wearing the admin hat over here. Um, so you guys are familiar now with the join token. That's exactly what I use now to, to join a node. Um, you can actually rotate those uh, tokens right from here as well. So if you are, for example, if you become, you know, the default is set to 90 days. But if you want to be able to kind of rotate these and just make sure you suddenly found out that in my enterprise, there's been a huge issue. I want to be able to rotate them. You can rotate these from here as well. Certificates, we made it even more easier for you to be able to use. Previously, uh, it was a little cumbersome. That's the, good, that's the feedback we got. Now you can actually just upload those certificates here, copy, paste it, and it will work right out of the box uh, from here as well. Um, uh, of course, if you want to use external, uh, external certs, absolutely fine. You can go use them as well. Uh, logs, I just did this right now uh, while uh, Vivek was talking. I just entered. Uh, a simple elk stack that I brought up over here, uh, which is running on here. And all I did was, that's it, that's my elk stack that's running. You can use whatever it is want. This is, this is something important as well, right? Um, what Docker believes in and what any product that comes out of Docker follows a pluggable model. And that's very, very important because, say suppose you've, you've already invested on Splunk. That's your logging infrastructure. You should be able to use it. Say suppose you've invested on a monitoring solution, you should be able to use it. Now in my case, I'm an administrator, I, I have an ELF stack that's running. So all I'm doing is I just fire it to my ELF stack over here, I update it and I can choose whatever logging I want and I'm gonna be updated over here and those logs are gonna show up over here, right? So it's a very, very pluggable model on this. So if you already have existing infrastructure, existing tools, UCP and DTR will just fit right into it and just work from there. 
So now we, we talked about the users we created across it. Obviously, if you're having an organization of 1,000 or 10,000 or whatever, whatever capacity you are at, you can't go create all these users individually, right? So then you would move on to an LDAP kind of a situation where you can just plug into your existing LDAP or Active Directory and use it from there as well. Um, DTR, so like, like what Vivek had mentioned, there, there's two components. UCP is a piece where you actually run the applications, run the containers, and DTR, a Docker trusted registry, is your on-prem solution where you will store your images. Um, when I say on-prem, it doesn't have to actually be on-prem. It could be in your private cloud. It's just not something like a Docker Hub which is being maintained. So you can actually have integration into DTR and UCP itself. So that entire end-to-end -end chain that Vivek talked about, once you have an image in DTR as signed and you enable signed only over here, it will pull only signed images. And I'll show you real quick on that. Um, you can skip this is standard stuff. Once you get a license, you upload it here. Uh, this is the stats you want to be able to do. Scheduling. Uh, again, a lot of cust uh, customers ask about this. Hey, and you know, if you're, if you're from the IT world, you'll understand how important it is to make sure that your applications are not actually deployed on an administrator node, like the UCP actual controller node. You want it to be deployed on a worker node. Same thing with on the DTR node. So you can actually go set that up as well. This is Content Trust. This is the snapshot that um, Vivek had uh, I brought up about here. Once I select this, right, only signed images will run in my cluster. So um, I, I'm, I, I know I kept DTR for later, but I want to quickly just jump in just to show you guys what a signed image is. Um, let me see. My DTR should be here. Um, I was just pushing a signed image. Okay. Um, so you guys can see that this is a signed image, right? Tagged signed. And when I pull this image, only the image is signed. Once I select this, will be able to run. If I was to pull the, the other image with this tag, which is just Harish tag, which is not a signed image, this image won't run. Now, why is this important? Right? This becomes really important and if you're running an organization and you want you don't want, say, developers just going and pulling any image from outside. I mean it's good to finally test it on their on their laptop. That's totally cool. But when you want to run it in production, if you want to make sure that it's only, you know, like uh, say say I work for um, uh, Panasonic. Panasonic signed images is what is the only one that's supposed to be done. So you can actually sign it accordingly on that and, and make sure that if it's not signed, it won't be run in pre-prod, it won't be run in test, and obviously it won't be run in production. So this is a very, very powerful feature to use. And once you push it, it's fine. That's, where it's, that's how it's going to be there. Um, and then routing mesh. So, you know, let's go back here. Oh, I checked my friend off. That's good. So routing mesh, this is the HTTP routing mesh. Obviously, it's experimental right now. This is where you go. You actually enable your HTTP routing mesh over here. You can specify what port you want. But once you enable this, then you should be able to um, have your uh, routing mesh configured. Uh, so the difference is, just, just double click on this, routing mesh is HTTP level, right? So it's layer seven. And this basically uses the layer four built-in routing mesh that's already existing in the Docker engine. So we built this on top of this. This is very unique to UCP only. It does use the, uh, uh, the open source features, but it's been built specifically because here, that's where the value add is in terms of the application level. Um, throughout mesh over here. You can also go and set up multiple scheduling strategies. If you want your containers to be, you know, spread or they want to be bin packed, which is basically take all the containers, put them in one node before it completely fills up and then move to another one. And similarly, random basically means I don't care, just put it, just throw it onto that. Um, I know b before we started, there was a lot of people asking about signing, so I'm going to show that real quick. And then we can go to DTR. Uh, I think I actually was pushing something over here. Okay, there you go. Um, so, so w the whole concept of signing basically is, um, you know, Docker Content Trust, uh, uh, which is based off the open source piece called Notion, right? Let's talk about w what exactly is this sign. I'm Harish. I've created this image. And I pushed this image, right? And now Chris and Vivek are actually pulling these images. How do you know that this is actually an image that was signed by Harish? And that's where Content Trust actually helps. So now you can make sure that when you're actually pulling the image, it was an image that was actually signed by Harish. 
So what you can do is let's let's try to demonstrate this. Right? Let's take a simple image that we already have over here. What do we have? Uh, repositories. Okay. Let's put a nginx. So now I'm pulling this image, right? Um, while this comes down, anyway, I'm pulling this from the hub. I'm going to sign this image, and you know the typical process everybody knows, right? You can pull an image, you can tag it, and then you actually push it to DTR. So now I have it. Now what I would do is I would tag this image. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to copy paste and cheat a little bit, and I think you guys will be okay with that. So first is I'm going to talk to you what happens without Docker Content Trust, right? So this is very simple. Everybody has done this. You take an image, you tag it, you specify which DTR you're pushing it, which repository you're pushing it, and now I'm just going to call it unsigned so that it makes a difference, right? That's it. I'm done. Now all I'm going to do is I just need to push it, right? So how do I push an image? Very simple. You just push it with the name of the actual image, right? So it's now it's actually going just to show you guys that it didn't exist and I'm not cheating. And once it's pushed, you'll see that tag come up. After that, what you typically do is, now I'm going to show you, once you've enabled this and you try to pull the same image back because it's not signed, it's going to say it's going to fail. So then it's going to ask you to sign it before you actually push it, and that, that's, that's what we're going to be doing offshore of this. So now we're actually pushing to the DTR. So while, while that push happens, uh, let me just show you a couple of things on the DTR side as well, uh, just to save time. So that's Docker Trusted Registry. For most of you, you've seen the hub. Uh, you're very familiar with the look and feel of the interface. So you see over here, um, I have repositories. You can have multiple organizations over here. I've created these multiple organizations. Each organization will have repositories, uh, and you can say, okay, I want only this team to be able to access these repositories. I want only those teams to be able to access those repositories, et cetera, right? So those are the things which um, is available in a Docker Trusted Registry as well. It has multiple storage backends. One thing is the notary piece is integrated into it. That's why you see the signed check, which I showed you guys before. The main reason is because notary is actually included into it itself. So that's very, very powerful. Uh, you don't need to do any, any settings at all. It works right out of the box. You have a DTR, you've authenticated with it, you go through this process and you're actually signing your images. Uh, you have multiple backends as well. Um, I'm using S3. You have, you know, you can you can have S3, Azure, Swift, uh, wherever you go planning to run it, or if you're having your on-prem, I don't know, EMC, NetApp, Dell, whatever storage you're using, you can use that as well. Um, garbage collection is also another key factor. Um, what this allows you to do is once you start accumulating a lot and a lot of images, this runs as a process in the background. You can actually set it up. I can say like run every once every midnight, simple cron job kind of an expression you set it up here, and then it will run and it will clean up all those images for you. Uh, keep in mind, this is a hard delete. You're actually getting your storage space back. So um, this is a very, very powerful tool, again, very unique to the Docker Trusted Registry. All right, cool. So this guy is actually the push has succeeded. Let's go to a look at our push. Uh, we pushed it to next. Just said pull by admin, right? So I'm, I, I authenticated myself as an admin. Now what we're going to do is the key factor to enable is right. Basically, what it is saying is export Docker content trust equals one. Now what we'll do is we've enabled content trust. Now what happens if I try to pull it? You see that? That failed. Why? Because it's not a signed image, right? It said remote trust data does not exist for this. And this is the key factor. So now it will fail if it doesn't have the signed images. But now say suppose I enable this and now let me sign the, let me do the same signature on it, right? Right? So, oh, sorry. I'll have to tag it. I'm basically going to just repeat. Right? Now I'm tagging the image as signed instead of unsigned. 
And but the key is again, remember you have to enable this, right? And now let's try to push it. There you go. It asks me for the for the keys. And this is the key factor of what content trust is, right? Content trust is based on you know you signing the keys with the hierarchy of keys on it. So let's sign this key. And done. It's signed. You go back here, fresh. And there you go. That's the signed image that we just sent out over here, right? It's got the tag on that. That so this uh, this is the exact kind of thing about this whole signing of images. Um, I just made it pretty simple so you guys and because I wanted you guys to focus on understanding what's going on, right? Obviously, this, this thing can be automated. You, you, typically, if you have multiple teams pushing, they're not going to be pushing it directly. You will probably have a Jenkins workflow, something like this, that you walk through. Um, oops, sorry. Something like this, where they sign it, it goes through a Jenkins, Jenkins builds it, pushes it to DTR, and that keys can be automatically transmitted on this. Obviously, this will be the focus of another demo or stuff. Um, I know we have only five minutes. I, I do want to respect time, uh, so let's let's just jump in straight into questions. Sure, I know we have a bunch of questions here. Um, maybe I can I take a look at the portal. Um, so let's we can start taking some of these as they come in. Yeah, so uh, let me go through and see what I can find. Uh, you want to call out the questions for me too? I can I can take for you as well. But just like it to me. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, so there's a question around what kind of RBAC controls are available for networks and load balancing features. So uh, for specifically for networking, you can use the same label-based access control uh, that you use for containers and services for networks. So you can provide a label which says, uh, basically says that uh, teams that have, have access to, say, the prod label, uh, and you only allow people in the, in the production team to have access to the prod label, and then you uh, assign the prod label to the network. So it works very similar. It's very granular. It allows you to assign to, on a per-network basis which teams have access. A um, couple of other things. Uh, for the built-in HTTP routing mesh, which external load balancers are supported? Nginx and HA proxy. What about AWS EC2 Elastic Load Balance? Does it work similar to what Interlock was doing? Uh, answer there is that effectively any external load balancer is supported. Uh, we don't we don't set limits on what you can use. Uh, that support is going to come from whatever load balancer provider you choose to use. So if you use Nginx Plus, their support is going to come from the Nginx. If you use uh, AWS ELD, the support will come from uh, Amazon. Uh, it, that said, it works somewhat similar to what Interlock was doing in that it provides the routing uh, of host names to specific containers, uh, and you can use the, a load balancer on top of that to provide additional capabilities and, and load balancing uh, and load balancing properties. So importantly, you can use Interlock and the new routing mesh side by side. You'd use the HTTP routing mesh for services and you'd use interlock and that reference architecture for non-swarm mode containers, and you can use those in parallel. So that's, uh, cool. that's probably something important. I see a few questions, Vivek, so I can take the ones from the bottom up uh, while, you, while you take a look as well. Uh, is UCP replacing Kitematic? Um, actually, it's two separate things. Kitematic is, comes through what is uh, Docker Toolbox. It's, it's for the developer when you, when you use Toolbox for the developer side. Think of UCP as your orchestration solution, which you are using across it. Um, you know, managing multiple uh, managing a cluster of nodes, which are actually running these containers oh, on it. Kitematic is more like an interface across it. Um, can it manage multiple swarm mode clusters? Uh, today, we it's one UCP per one swarm cluster, and once uh, pretty soon it's there in the roadmap. Like we like had mentioned, we will have uh, the ability to be able to manage. Um, Multiple uh, clusters as well. Can nodes be added uh, running on AWS? Oh, yes. In fact, my node is actually on AWS. Sorry, was there a question? Yeah, just one second. I, I think what I want to do is I want to send. I want to show one more slide here before we um, oh, okay. finish sure. up. Sure. Um, 
I think it's important just so people understand like the pricing and how we're actually selling this thing or how they can actually purchase it, right? So Docker data centers are available as a subscription, right? So there's three different options. First off, we offer a free 30-day trial. And in that case, you have access to the full platform, right? Universal control plane, the registry. Um, now, there's two other options, business day and business critical. And the key difference there is, one, for the business day, we're providing support from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. local time. Business critical is 24-7, 365, right? So as you can see, the pricing for business day is 1,500 per node per year, right? And the business critical is $3,000 per node per year as well. As I'm sure I saw a couple of questions around pricing and how we're actually providing that. Um, so I wanna jump back into some of the questions. I know the fake ad is on one of these. Let me, let's get back to that one. Oh, here's a, here's a good question. What checks does the new Docker data center have for potential noisy neighbor container scenarios or for rogue containers hogging the underlying infrastructure? So actually, this is an existing feature within Docker. Uh, you can set resource limits or constraints. So you can say, this container is only allowed to use this share of CPU and this share of memory. That's a check that you have then against noisy neighbors. You can use the built-in logging and monitoring tools in order to, to determine which ones are using heavy CPU or memory usage. Uh, and then when you redeploy those containers or restart that service, you can set limit uh, set limits around resources and constraints. So that's a uh, uh, that's a that allow you to take care of that specific scenario. Uh, a couple other questions Let is me the see. routing mesh. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Take that. I was going to the routing mesh feature available in the open source free version of the Docker engine. So the the uh, port-based routing mesh, the container, uh, so where you expose a port and then uh, any incoming traffic is moved across uh, uh, is moved across the nodes, but only from a port basis. That's layer four TCP-based load balancing. That is available in the open source version. The HTTP routing mesh, the layer seven intelligent routing, is in Docker Data Center in the commercial version of the product. Parish, I think you had a question. Cool, yeah, no, I mean, I was just gonna uh, address the other ones as well. Is it possible to create a new node just from the GUI without copy-pasting the command in the engine? Not currently, but uh, we, can, we can take a look at it um, just to see what the, what the need is on that uh, and from the request on it. I mean, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good request. We, we'll take that into consideration. Uh, in Crockett, will it ever be in Docker Data Center, uh, something I've got for Cloud Foundry? Uh, it's not there currently, uh, but it's a good, good question as well. Again, uh, infra kit is something you want to think about for provisioning at the node level, right? And Docker data centers are level above it. Could we use infra kit um, inside it uh, as, as part of an enabler? We could. Um, that's something we still haven't, haven't thought about it, uh, but that's a good suggestion. We, we can think about it because looking at infra kit as more on provisioning the infra before we actually have uh, Docker data center up because Docker data center assumes you already have those things ready before you're actually provisioning it. And I think uh, there's, a, there's a question here around um, DTR. So. Will I need two separate DTRs for the QA and prod clusters? Uh, so that depends on how you set up your deployment. Uh, you can you can have two deployments that are pulling. Uh, two, two clusters that are pulling from the same DTR. However, for the purposes of automatic integration from a notary perspective, uh, you will integrate on a one-to-one -one basis, right? So when you're when you're doing the signing, you can uh, if if you want to have automatic trust between a DTR and UCP, that's on a one-to-one -one basis. However, technically, you can have multiple uh, clusters pulling from the same DTR as long as you provide the relevant login information each time you uh, you want to get the images you need. Cool. Um, real quick, Windows containers supported in Docker Data Center. We already covered uh, that one. Yeah, okay, I think, cool. yeah, we touched on this one um, when you were calling back in. Oh, okay. uh, there's a question mm -hmm. on speaking to the noisy neighbor answer. Does RBAC allow you to limit users to percentage of CPU or number of containers that they can spin up? Not today. Uh, RBAC specifically is limiting the, the types of users and, uh, and what they can do with the containers. However, we are looking at the future at how we can expand our back to consider performance or node-based use cases. So I will take that feedback under, under advisement. Thank you very much. Was there There's a, a question? Uh, I want to make sure 1604, not yet on the CS engine. That's 
that's high on the priority that, that's heavily being tested. Uh, pretty soon we will add support for uh, Ubuntu 16.4. That's the next Another one. question. Is there any possibility to trace which user is accessing a container and then communicating with another container within the first one? Two questions there. So can you, can you trace which user is accessing a container? Yes. Uh, using our syslog implementation, which you can set in the settings, uh, you can basically pipe all commands that are sent against the UCP to a syslog server of your choice or to a logging or monitoring uh, company like Splunk that also accepts syslog. And from there, you can, you can do auditing and determine which user tried to access a container. Uh, the second part, communicating with another container within the first container, uh, that's a little tougher because you're, you're basically doing Docker and Docker at that point. Uh, we don't really have the ability to see what's happening within that container from the, from the audit request. So that's a, that's a little bit more of a specialized, uh, specialized app. So it, it might be possible depending on what output you pipe from the container, but not generally speaking. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I know we're about three minutes over. What we'll do is we can create a blog post and kind of answer a bunch of these questions and highlight the ones maybe we didn't get to, and that can go out on Monday. So we'll be sure to send that to your way as well. So, I just want to say thanks to everyone in the audience for being here and, and hearing about Docker Data Center. A uh, special thanks to Vivek for talking us through the What's New features, and a special thanks to Harish for walking us through the demo and also helping out with the uh, QA questions as well. So thank you both for that. Cool. Awesome. Happy to be there, and thanks, Chris, for organizing this. Thanks, everybody. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it.